After crossing the Red Sea, God led the Israelites on a journey through the wilderness toward Mount Sinai. And even though they criticized Moses, grumbled and complained, God continued to miraculously and graciously provide for his chosen people. When the Israelites did nothing to deserve it, God chose them as his treasured possession, drew near to them, and gave them the law and a covenant. On this trek through the wilderness would our eyes be opened to see God's unwavering commitment to his people despite their unfaithfulness and shortcomings? And would our obedience to God reveal to us the promise of his blessings? Now this morning, I'm going to share with you uh, something the Lord has been teaching me tremendously over this particular week. I, it's been a real emotional week for me. Uh, I found myself even just there a moment ago weeping at the thought of what we're singing to God. And uh, to get through the message today is going to be difficult, uh, toward the end especially, because I'm going to talk about what I think is one of the most important things in our lives as human beings. It's identity. It's knowing who we are. If somebody asked, who are you? What you would answer, your identity, I think is probably the most important thing about you. And wouldn't you know it, that on a particular week when I'm about to preach about identity, the one place the enemy comes after me is in my identity. I'm going to share about that at the end of the sermon, but a hard attack on my identity. But it was because the Lord was showing me what the enemy meant for evil, God turned around to use for good, that this is why identity is so important. Because your identity determines everything about you. I want to teach you maybe a principle that you, you, you might have in the wrong sequence. Your identity determines what you do. What you do does not determine your identity. Now, oftentimes we, we flip those. We think that what we do determines who we are. We're the sum total of our actions. But I want to flip it. I want to tell you who you are determines what you do. And the number one way that I want you to see this is in all your failed attempts to change. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Please don't raise your hand. But how many of you have tried to kick a bad habit and just weren't able to do it? Don't raise your hand. My guess is all of us would have our hands up in the air. Like I've just tried to stop drinking so much, can't stop. Tried to look at, the, not to stop looking at those things online that I'm supposed to look at, but I can't stop. I stopped trying to get angry, being angry all the time, and I can't seem to stop lying all the time. I can't stop being so materialistic, and I can't stop, whatever, fill in the blank. That habit, that addiction, that whatever that thing is that I want to change, you've tried so hard to change, and you haven't been able to, to kick it. And I think the reason why is because so many of us are approaching it incorrectly. We think if I change what I do, ultimately the end result will be I'll become a new person. And you'll never get there until you change who you are. There's a book, this sermon isn't going to be about this book, but it's, a, it's, a, it's not a Christian book. It's called Atomic Habits by a guy named James Clear. I, I'd recommend you read it. Uh, it's a really in, in, intriguing book about the way habits work. But kind of the basic premise of the whole thing is about identity. It says, if you really want to change your habits, you have to see yourself as a different kind of person, that you become, you become the kind of person that does the right things. The basic way he uses, think about diet. Most of us, when we go on a diet, we view ourselves as an overweight person trying to lose weight. And so we, we have this affinity for Lay's potato chips. Every time we sit on the couch, it triggers it. And we just start munching away on potato chips. So what do we do? All right. By willpower, I'm going to change. I'm no longer going to eat potato chips, and that's going to make me healthy. And if you've ever tried that, there's a reason why Lay's potato chips says you can only, no one can eat just one. Like they have cocaine in them, I'm pretty sure. Like they're super addictive, (laughs) and there's some kind of drug in them that makes you just keep going and going and going. You can last a day, and then you're done. You'd be right back the next day. It's not worth it losing weight. You're crumbling away in your potato chips the next day. You you won't last because it's willpower alone. And your willpower will dry up. And his point in the book is, if you really want to change, you have to now see yourself not as an overweight person trying to lose weight, but you're a healthy person. You're the kind of person that doesn't eat potato chips. And when you have a new identity and you're sitting on the couch, no longer do you grab the chips because you're, you're just not the kind of person that would eat chips when you're sitting on the couch. You have a new identity and your actions roll from that identity. Now, that might sound crazy to you, but I've actually seen this true in my life, specifically in the area of health. 
I view myself as a runner. I have been running for decades. I, when I think about myself, I would describe myself, I, I'm a runner. And so every single morning when I wake up, I know I'm going to get after the word of God. And right when I'm done with that, I'm going to lace up my shoes and I'm going to go out for a run. Why? Because I'm a runner. I don't debate. I don't fight. I don't, it's not, uh, the only reason I don't run is if there's a reason why I'm not running. My default is to run. Why? Because I'm a runner. Now, there's some of you out there, and you spent way too much money on a really nice pair of sneakers. You determined that you were going to change your ways. You're tired of being lazy. You're going to start running. And you think that if you just wake up in the morning and go run for a few weeks, you'll become a runner. You've probably have those shoes with no dirt on the bottom of them. They sit in your closet. Maybe you did one day, and you're like, dude, this is Texas summer, man. I, I ain't running. You said you're going to wait till the winter time. Winter time came. That's too cold out there. I'm not going running. You go to the gym, but you forgot to get a gym membership, so you never started running. And so those shoes sit up there. You have not become a runner. The reason why is because you don't really view yourself as a runner. You're trying by willpower to do it. Well, I don't have to will it. I know what I'm doing. When I had a catastrophic hamstring injury, the first question I had for my physical therapist is how long till I can run? Why? Because I'm a runner. This is what I do. I annoyed the fire out of my physical therapist. Now, today, now, now, now. She was so annoyed with me until finally she said, you can run. I do it because that's who I am. My identity controls my actions. Now, let me tell you why this matters. This is not going to be a self-help kind of sermon. This is not about atomic habits. This is about knowing your identity in Jesus Christ. Because until you get that fixed, no matter how hard you try to change your ways, nothing will stick. When you get your identity right, though, everything will change. Today, what I hope to prove to you is that your actions are more like a thermometer, but your identity is a thermostat. So your actions will tell you the temperature of your heart. They'll, they'll tell, like if you never go to church, if you're never generous, if you never pray, if you don't ever read the word, if you don't do anything at all, if the, th if the thermometer is reading ice cold, guess what? Your heart is probably ice cold. So your actions are good for one thing. They tell you the temperature of your heart, but they can't change it. It's a little bit like some of you in here probably remember like the, the old thermometers that you had the mercury and you had to shake them before you put them in your mouth because it would reset. Well, when you shake it, it would change what it was reading, but then it would always recalibrate back to the, the real temperature. Like shaking the thermometer might change it for a moment, but it wouldn't actually change the temperature. Well, this is what we try to just change our habits, our actions. All we're doing is just shaking the thermometer. It might adjust for a little bit. But you're going to go right back to where you were before. But if you go to your house and you change the thermostat, if your AC is working, which is always questionable in the Texas summer, if your AC is working, then the temperature will drop or rise, depending on where you are. You can actually adjust the temperature. That's identity. When your identity changes, the temperature of your heart changes. So your actions don't change you. Your identity does. So today, I want to teach you from the Word of God how your identity can change. But oddly enough, though it's completely contingent on Christ, we're actually going to begin uh, over a thousand years before Jesus was born in the book of Exodus, chapter 19. Grab your Bibles. I want you to open up. Exodus 19. Now, when you're going to Exodus 19, uh, we're, those of us who, have, uh, who are new here, we, we always have guests with us. We're journeying through the book of Exodus. We're now, we find ourselves in chapter 19, just going through the book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And this is a swing point in the book of Exodus. When we get to chapter 20... We're going to get to the Ten Commandments. The law of God is going to begin. And I, I shared with this last week with you that this particular turning point is when it goes from the story of God's rescue, the Exodus moment, to now the commandments. And here we have Moses back at Mount Sinai. And he's going to receive in just a moment the Ten Commandments. But I want you to see what God gives him before the commandments come. Sequence is very order. He's going to talk about identity. And then in chapter 20 come the commandments. Identity first. Action second. So let's go ahead and read it. We're going to read the first six verses of chapter 19, and I want you to listen to how it digs into identity. Exodus 19, beginning in verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. And they set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. And there Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. And the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. I want you to really focus in on verses 5 and 6. He says, I want to give you your identity. I want you to know who you are. You are my treasured possession. You are a kingdom of priests. You are a holy nation. Now, I want you to remember for just a moment who God is talking to. He's talking to people who just three months before this moment were considered property. They were slaves in the land of Egypt. They were the dregs of society. You had pack mule and Hebrew people on the same plane, owned by the Egyptians, seen as the lowest of low, not even really human. That was their identity. And now God says, let me give you a brand new identity. You're no longer the property of somebody else. You're now my property. You are my treasured possession. You now, you used to be slaves. You're a kingdom of priests. You used to be considered lowly. You're now a holy nation. That's who you are. He says, I want you to know your identity. Now, I want you to think about the, the order here, the sequence. Remember, I told you, coming next, chapter 20 is going to be the Ten Commandments. And after this, the rest of the book of Exodus is primarily the law coming to the people. All the commands, the rules and regulations. But identity comes first and then the commands. Now, notice the sequence. If it had been reversed, if God had given them the Ten Commandments and then all the laws that they're supposed to follow and then said, now you're my treasured possession if you do all these things, then it would have been their actions determining their identity. But God very intentionally started with identity. He said, here's who you are, and when you become a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, my treasured possession, then the Ten Commandments become just the kinds of things that people like this do. When you're my treasured possession, you don't take the name of the Lord in vain. When you're a treasured possession, you keep the Sabbath. You don't lie. You don't cheat. You don't steal. You don't kill. These are the kinds of things that my treasured possession do, that a kingdom of priests and a holy nation do. Your identity is secure, and therefore, this is what you do. Now, this is what God was trying to communicate to them, but what you're going to learn very quickly is they completely missed it. They, they utterly thought that their identity hinged on their actions, and you see it in the next two verses, because what you're going to hear is that they're all action. All right, God, we'll change our actions so that we can become your treasured possession. Just look at verses 7 and 8. Listen to how they respond. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. We will do action. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything God says, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll obey all the rules and regulations, Moses. We're going to do it. And when we do it, then we're going to become God's treasured possession. They were under the mindset of action first, identity second. Now, God knew something they didn't know. God knew what was going to happen in the next chapter, in the next chapter, in the next book, in the next book, in the next century, and the, the next millennium. He knew that God's people would fail over and over. And he didn't matter. He knew it didn't matter how many prophets he sent to them, how hard he tried to get them to change. They were never going to change. He knew they could not obey the commands. And therefore, after their ignorant response of, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll obey you completely, Lord. He says, guys, let me go ahead and tell you who you are. And then let me tell you who I am. The rest of the chapter, that's all he's doing. He's going to say, I want you to see who you really are. You cannot obey my commands. But let me tell you who I am. I can do what you cannot do. That's the rest of chapter 19. I want you to flip on. We're going to keep on going in verse 9 and on and see immediately. And they go, we can do it, Lord. Listen to how he reframes the conversation so they can see who they really are. Verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. And when Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people and you shall set limits for the people all around saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot, whether beast or man. He shall not live. And when the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. It's an odd ending there, but he's just saying, don't defile yourselves in this time of consecration. Now, now notice what he says twice. He says, consecrate yourself, consecrate yourself, wash your garments, wash your garments. 
Now, let me ask you a question. Why do you wash your garments? Because they're dirty. So you don't throw your garments into the washing machine unless they're dirty, unless they're stanky. And you put them in there, hopefully. You wash what's dirty. Why do you consecrate yourself? Because you're not consecrated. Because you're unholy. You only consecrate yourself when you need consecration, when you need holiness. Let me tell you what God is saying with this act. He's saying to his own people, guys, I know you think you can do what the law requires, but you just aren't holy enough. You're dirty. You're defiled. You're filthy. You won't be able to do it. What he's saying with these commands is very simple. Do not put your faith in yourself. If you think you're going to earn righteousness by obeying my commands, you are going to fail miserably. Don't put your faith in yourself. And then he's going to come around and say, but put your faith in me. And therefore, directly following this reminder of their lack of holiness, he comes in to show them his splendor and majesty in holiness. And he does it through something called a theophany. A theophany is just a, a technical word to mean an appearance of God. And when God appears... You see him in majesty and glory, this time in a trembling mountain. So listen to what happens next as we keep on reading in verse 16 to verse 20. It says, On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. And the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So you have this picture now of God. And think about how glorious all, all these people are. They're, they're at the foot of the mountain. They don't dare go up, and they see God descend upon it, and the whole mountain begins to tremble. And there's fire and thunder and lightning and the people are scared to death there's smoke everywhere and fire and they see this glory and they say it says they begin to tremble in fear why do you think God is doing this he wants them to see his majesty he wants them to look at themselves and go guys you are not clean you can't do this don't put your faith in yourself put your faith in the mountain put your faith in my glory in my splendor, look to me, not to yourself, because I'm greater than you. I'm more powerful than you. I can do what you cannot do. In the very last few verses of this chapter, he just comes one more time to say, because you've seen yourself, because you've seen me, remember. Remember the distinction. Remember who I am. Remember who you are. Let's finish up the chapter, verses 21 to 25. It says, and the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people, and he told them. So one more time, he's emphasizing here the separation. I'm holy, I'm majestic, you aren't. You are unholy and broken. He is setting the standard right now of where I, our identity comes from. He says, do not look to yourself, look to me. You cannot, I can. Then, in chapter 20, come the Ten Commandments. Because of who I am and my identity given to you, therefore, obey all the rules and regulations I give to you. Because I've given you a new identity. Now, the reason Israel struggled so much with this is the same reason you and I struggle with this. It's because we completely misunderstand verse 5. You may not even know what verse 5 says, but trust me, this is the mindset that keeps us broken day in and day out. We think it all hinges on our behavior. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard people tell me, I'm trying so hard to change my ways, Jason. Look, I mean, I've been going to church. I'm not cussing anymore. I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not slipping around anymore. I look at all these things I'm doing, and I'm just hoping I'm doing enough to be right with God. It's a mindset born from a misunderstanding of verse 5. Go back to verse 5 of chapter 19. It says, Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. 
It's this mindset that says, oh, look, see, it's conditional. If I obey you, God, if I keep all your commandments, God, if I do what's good and right, then I get to be your treasured possession. If I do all the right actions, then my identity shifts. You see, it says it right there, Jason. I want you to know that is not what that passage says. I said a word that maybe you didn't notice was not what the word in the scripture says. It doesn't say if you keep my commandments, you'll be my treasured possession. It says if you keep my covenant, you'll be my treasured possession. You see, what was coming next wasn't the covenant. It was the commandments. The covenant actually had already come all the way back in Genesis chapter 15. It was a covenant not made with Moses. It was a covenant made with a guy named Abram, whose name would become Abraham. It was made to Abraham and all his descendants. And these are the very descendants that we see in Exodus 19. And when he says, keep the covenant, that's so different than obey the rules and regulations of the commandments. I'm going to tell you about this covenant. In fact, I'd love for you to go over to Genesis chapter 15 in your Bible I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want, to, I want to teach you about this covenant that he's telling them to keep. Now, a covenant, in Genesis 15, you see an example of a covenant that was very common in the ancient world. The way you would make a covenant in the ancient world is there would be two parties, usually two kings or two military leaders, and they would come together, and they would sacrifice animals. You would split them right down the middle, and you would put half on one side half on the other, and the blood would just run through. And you would create a pathway of animals that you had sacrificed. And then what would happen is one of the kings or one of the generals would get up and he would walk through the pathway, stepping on the blood as he went through until he finished the end. And then the other person would come and walk through the blood as well. And when they both finished, with blood still on the bottom of their feet, they were saying, I agree to the terms of our covenant at the price of blood. If I break the covenant, the stipulation is I pay for it with blood. They had made a blood pact with one another. That's how you made a covenant in the ancient world. And so God actually does this exact same thing with Abram or Abraham. He says, okay, Abraham, here's what I want you to do. I want you to cut open animals. I want you to lay them out. I want you to create a pathway. But instead of both parties walking through, God does something unusual. This is where we're going to come in. Genesis chapter 15, verses 17 and 18. Listen to what it says. It says, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So he says, I'm making a covenant with you, Abram, but notice the difference. Abram never walked on the blood through the animals. The only one who did was God in the flaming torch. He passed through, and he alone. Now, let me tell you what that means. It means God is saying, if I break the pact, if I break the tenets of this covenant, I'll pay for it with blood. Abram, if you or any of your descendants break the terms of this covenant, I'll pay for it with blood. You or me, I'll be the one to give blood. And you wonder why Jesus had to die on a cross over a thousand years later. This was God making good with his covenant with Abram. You broke the terms of the conditions of it. You broke the covenant. Therefore, I pay for it with blood. That's the covenant I made with you. So this is what he's talking about in Exodus 19. When he says, keep the covenant, he's not saying keep the commandments, obey all the rules and regulations. He's saying, trust in my ability to save you. I'm the one who walked through. I'm the one who ratified this covenant. You trust in me. That's why the conditional statement in verse 5 is if you, in the English translation, ESV says, obey my voice. Literally in Hebrew, it says, listening, you listen to my voice and keep my covenant. Meaning, if you take what I say to be true, if you live in accordance with my truth, and my truth is a covenant that I made that depends upon me, not upon you, if you do that, you will be saved. You will be my treasured possession. You will be a kingdom of priests. You will be a holy nation. The only thing it requires from any other human being is faith. That God, when he says he will save us, doesn't lie. Doesn't depend upon you or how holy you try to be or how hard you try to change your ways or how, how much you cleaned yourself up because you can't do it. I can't do it. God says, don't look to yourself. Find your identity in me. 
Now, I've got to be honest with you. If you were a theologian right now, you'd be going, well, that's great, Jason. That was a good promise made to Rick Weintraub and the descendants of the Jewish people. But what about the rest of us who aren't Jews? Because this, this right here is a promise, make no mistake about it, to the nation of Israel, not to us Gentiles in here. So what do we do with this? Let me tell you what we do. We go to 1 Peter chapter 2, where there's a promise made to you and me, and it is almost verbatim, but praise God, this promise is made to a whole bunch of Gentiles like you and me. I want you to flip over to the New Testament. It's almost at the very end of the Bible. It took that long to get here. You're reading through the Bible, and you're wondering what's going to happen. You get to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, and listen to what Peter says to all who would believe in Jesus Christ. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He's saying to all these Gentiles, listen, you weren't born Jewish. You used to not be a part of the people of God. You were dead in your own sins and had no mercy, but now you have received my mercy. You have become my people. You now, Gentile, who believes in Jesus Christ, you are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen race. You are a holy nation. You are God's treasured possession. That's now your identity. And everything you do is just because that's who you are. But let me go ahead and make sure you understand this, because this is the failure point. You are made this new person by what Christ did, not by what you do. I could say that a hundred times, and it still wouldn't be enough. You are made a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession, because of what Christ did, not because of what you have done. Everything in 1 Peter chapter 2 hinges on 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to read one last verse to you. Before I finish up, 1 Peter chapter 1, second half of verse 3 to verse 5. I want you to know where all this confidence comes from that we have of being a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and God's own possession. 1 Peter chapter 1, second half of verse 3 says this, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power, not your power, God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It says, according to his great mercy, not your behavior, not how hard you're trying to change your ways, his mercy, he says he has caused us to be born again. It's his work, not ours. It is God's power, in verse 5, through faith. And the only thing God asks of us in this whole beautiful picture of identity change is faith. Just believe I am who I say I am. And when you believe who I am, you become who I intended you to be. You become a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession, simply by believing Jesus really did bleed on a cross, paid for the tenets of the covenant because we broke it, went into a grave, three days later rose up from the dead and is alive today. When we believe that to be true, we are claiming the promises of God upon us and we have a brand new identity. And let me tell you about that identity. There is nothing that can shake it. It doesn't matter who has hurt you, how you've been abused. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you have made, how royally you have sinned. It doesn't matter your past, your present, your future. When you have that identity in Christ, nothing can take it away from you. First Peter chapter 1, verse 4. This inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Nothing will shake it. Now, I want you to know, God would not let me preach that empty-handed today and just throw it out there like a theological truth. He forced me to believe it by going through something this week that was really, really painful. Now, I'm going to tell something very intimate in my life, and I'm going to ask you, don't even try to speculate who I'm talking about, because it won't serve you or me or the Lord or anybody else. But I just need to share with you something that happened to me. On Wednesday, I, I received a phone call from somebody, and it was one of the most difficult phone calls of my life. The person on the other side of this phone call is a person that's important to me 
who, whose words matter to me. And this person wasn't in their right frame of mind, and they said some things that were exceptionally brutal, that were an attack on my identity. And at the end of that conversation, basically the word was, you're so messed up, Jason. You're so proud. You think you're better than everybody else because you lead this big old church, but you know who you really are. You know how screwed up you really are. Why don't you just admit it? And they're screaming to me on the phone, tearing down my identity. And this is somebody whose words about me matter. And I began to tremble uncontrollably as I'm listening to these words being spoken over me. And and I'm just, I'm shaken to the core, probably shaken because there was enough truth in what was spoken. Yes, I'm screwed up. Yes, I know I struggle with pride and all these things are true. They're true enough to hurt me so deeply that when I finished that phone call, I'm I'm about to go into a prayer gathering with a couple hundred people to gather together. And I don't even know if I can talk. I'm shaking, visibly shaking. My hands are shaking and trembling. And I don't know how to internalize what's just been spoken over me by somebody that I care about. And and I go down into the front, and I'm just praying, trying to keep some semblance of emotional control. I don't even know if I can go up on stage. I tell the other pastors who are there, you you need to get ready to take this, because I don't know if I can handle it. And I'm praying, and I'm on my face, and it finally comes time where I'm supposed to go lead my portion of the prayer gathering. And I feel like the Lord said, go up and just ask for help. So I went up on stage. Those of you who were there, you, you know, I just said, I need y'all to pray for me. I'm sorry. This may sound selfish. I need prayer. And there were people who came up on stage and prayed over me, people in the congregation who just pointed their hand toward me and prayed for me just to have enough strength. And God was gracious and gave me enough strength to lead the next portion, which I didn't realize was all for me. It was a portion of journaling. And I challenged the people who were there on Wednesday night, here's what we're going to do in this journaling time. You're going to do four things. Number one, you're going you're gonna to thank the Lord for how he's been good to you. Number two, you're going to praise the Lord for his attributes. Number three, you're going to confess to the Lord whatever you need to confess. And number four, you're going to ask the question, God, what are you trying to say to me? And I led through that part, and then I, I escaped over to a little closet area, and I got my journal out, and I went through it. And I began by praising God and thanking him for who he is. Let me tell you, it's hard to thank God when you just feel your insides torn to pieces. But I needed to. Because I needed to remember how good my God has been to me to frame the size of this issue. Remember, this isn't, this isn't everything. God has been so good to me. So I thank him for a while for all the ways he's been good. I begin to praise him because he's a God who's in control of all things. Then it comes time to confess. And I begin to confess, oh God, I can feel bitterness rooting inside of me. I can feel resentment, anger welling up. Oh God, take it out, take it out. I just began to confess and he began to un- root it out of me, this bitterness and resentment that wanted to grow. And then I got to the last part of it. The last part of it is, what does God want to say to you right now? And it hit me immediately, just the voice of the Spirit inside my head. And it was exactly what I needed to hear. The Father said to me through his Spirit, Jason, I love you, and I'm pleased with you. You are my beloved son. He said to me, you, Jason, are my treasured possession. You, Jason, are the apple of my eye. When I see you, Jason, I'm pleased. It was exactly what I needed to hear. Because all of a sudden, it reframed everything. It didn't matter to me anymore what another human being thought about me. It didn't matter what you thought about me or what my wife or my kids or, or family or friends or anybody else thought about me. All that mattered is that my father said, I see you. And I love you. And no one can take that away from you, Jason. God reminded me who I am. Because he reminded me whose I am. I belong to him. And he's pleased. Let me tell you something. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter what anybody else says about you. You want to know who you are? You're a child of the king. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's treasured possession. And nothing and no one can take that away from you. But let me remind you, you were not born into this possession. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
one of the biggest mistakes people make is they think they're born Christians. I, I'm, I, I grew up in the church. I'm a Christian. I go to church. I love Jesus. I'm a Christian. That's not how it works. There's a moment, the word says, we have to confess by our own sin. We don't belong to him. And then we say, I'm tired of trying to find my identity on my behavior, my actions, my obedience, all the stuff. I can't do it. And so I confess my frailty and brokenness to God. And I say, Jesus, forgive me. And then I say, Jesus, you take over. Own me. You be the master. I'll be the servant. Own me. In the moment you invite Christ to take over, you become his possession. And your identity gets changed. But every single human being Man and woman, boy and girl, has to make that decision for themselves. And until you do, you'll never find the power of how God can make you new. You'll try your whole life to change all the actions, and you're just playing with a thermometer. God is saying, I want to give you a brand new identity. I want to change the temperature of your heart. It comes through my son, Jesus Christ. So I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning. I believe there are some of you who need to say, today is the day I become somebody brand new. That's what the baptistry is for. This baptistry is a picture of a brand new identity. The old you, buried and gone. There's a brand new of you that comes out that says, I belong to God. And in that moment, you become his treasured possession. Not because that baptistry has power, but simply because the Bible says this is how we make our vow to God. When you get married, you come on a stage with a pastor there and you make public vows. That's how you become one. When Christ, you go into a baptistry. This is how you make a public vow to say, I'm one with him. I belong to him. And I believe there could be some of you today who are ready. If that's you in a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to come up here and to make this decision. But I also know there have been hundreds of you baptized over the last year. There are, there are hundreds more who have been people of faith for years and decades. I want to remind you of something, too. It doesn't matter how vile your sin has been. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are who he says you are. Not what your sin says you are, not what the devil says you are, not what the world says you are. You are who he says you are. We're going to sing a song in a moment that says, I am who you say I am. And you may need to remind yourself of, you may need to come down, bow down on these steps and remember that you are set free. You don't have to live in sin any longer. That's not who you are anymore. You are in Christ. And maybe you need to confess and remember your identity. Maybe you just need to sing to the Lord. Or maybe, maybe you're going through something really hard right now, and you need to remember that you are God's treasured possession. You are the apple of his eye. If he loves you this much, then why wouldn't he care for your greatest needs? So if you're carrying a burden, a weight, a trial, there are going to be prayer team members down front ready to grab hands with you, and we're going to take that need to a father who cares about you. And you coming is just a reminder that your God loves you, and you love him back, and you trust him. And if you need prayer, you can have that today. I'm going to invite you all to stand up right now. I'm going to invite prayer team members and pastoral staff to come spread out among the front. If you need to come bow down on your own, you can have the freedom to do so. You just walk down and let this be your altar. If you need prayer over something in your life, you can come let us know. But most importantly, if you're ready today to say, I'm going to, I'm going to stake my identity in Christ. I'm going to have a new identity today. I'm going to leave here a new person. You come let us know. We have a baptistry ready. We have t-shirts you can change into. We have counselors ready to meet with you. Today can be the day. You just got to come. We're ready for you. You come if you need to. Well, hey, we hope you enjoyed that content. Be sure to click here for more content and click here to subscribe.